Hi everyone, my name is Iqbal Chaudhary. Uh, I'm a PhD student in Hopkins and I organize uh, this event called Fireside Management Chat uh, every other Friday. Uh, so this chat is all about having people from industry and academia uh, to answer one of the, uh, some of the burning questions that we have related to management consulting. Uh, one such important question is about what to do at, when we want to go into life science consulting and we have a fantastic guest with us today uh, his name is anu aniruddh kaushik he's um, <laughs> he's a, he's a hopkins alumnus and uh, he's a friend so anu uh, is a senior consultant in life science uh, life sciences at guidehouse which is for, which was formerly navigant so prior to joining guidehouse anu interned at medtech ventures where he served as an expert analyst for venture capital investment and merger and acquisition advisory engagements so including performing market analysis and landscape assessment for small cap medical device companies as well. So he has uh, experience doing all that. Anyway, so Anu will talk about life science consulting today and uh, you know things related to uh, inter the interview process and um, some information about the company that he works with right now. And we'll have an interactive case study at the end. So without, much, uh, without further ado, I would like to welcome Anu. Uh, thanks, Anu, for spending your time with us. Yeah, thanks, Iqbal. Yeah. Thanks, Iqbal, some... for the great introduction. Go ahead, I'll, I'll let you finish. Sure, no, yeah, just just quick housekeeping rules. You can ask a question. Uh, uh, you can type your questions in the chat box. Let's make it interactive. So you can type all your questions in the chat box, or or you can unmute yourself and ask a question as well. And uh, as you probably have already noticed that this video is getting recorded, uh, this, this session is getting recorded because we want the content to be available for our future members. So if you have issues with recording, you can also stop sharing your video. All right, uh, I would not take more time. And please go ahead and uh, good luck. Great, thanks Iqbal. Um, so I'll go ahead and share my screen. Uh, so I have some slides prepared. Um, let's see. All right, uh, hopefully you guys are able to see my screen. Um, so yeah, so my name is Anu. Um, Iqbal gave a great introduction and I'll uh, talk a little bit about some of the stuff he uh, mentioned about my background. Um, but really, I think I want to make this as fluid of a conversation as possible. Um, I, uh, so if you guys can uh, put stuff in the chat, feel free. But I think um, based on what I'm looking at, it would be nice if you guys just unmute yourself and straight up interrupt me. I'm totally cool with that. Um, that might be a little better because I don't have to kind of read through the question and then um, waste more time because we only have like a little more than an hour. Uh, so uh, just a quick background um, of uh, what I want to cover today. Um, I'll talk a little bit about myself, about, um, and we'll kind of go into like a high level discussion on um, what is consulting, why is it for you? I am assuming that a lot of you are sort of still early stage thinking about is consulting the right career opportunity for me um, and why I should consider it. And so we'll um, sort of hopefully answer some of your questions um, regarding the field as a career path. Um, talk a little bit about life science co consulting in particular and um, about some of my experience into breaking into consulting from uh, academia and PhD. Um, so I know a lot of you might be master's uh, students um, and uh, do keep in mind that a lot of my experience is sort of going from PhD into consulting. And so a lot of the stuff I'll talk about refer uh, references like workflows and processes that are in place for getting PhDs into the consulting world. But I think there's a lot of overlap with masters as well. And so um, take what you can out of my talk. Um, and if you have more questions, you can obviously reach out to me later on and I can put you in touch with people that might be better able to speak to um, uh, your specific pathway. Um, and at, then at the end, let's see how much time we have. We'll go through a case example and um, we'll um, kind of have different levels of interactivity depending on um, how much time's remaining. So let's jump right into it. So this is me, um, you guys can see me. Uh, I don't know why I put a picture, but this was like a stock slide I had. Uh, I am a uh, senior consultant at Guidehouse. So when I applied to Guidehouse, it was called Navigant. Uh, I was a different company. Navigant got acquired by Guidehouse when I had my first interview actually. So, um, and at this point, Guidehouse is pretty much sort of um, uh, taken in Navigant. And we, I'll talk a little bit later on about how Navigant fits into the entire Guidehouse framework. But uh, my specific area is in life sciences, um, fits in with my background, which was um, in um, mechanical engineering, uh, engineering, developing diagnostic devices. So I worked at the 
uh, BioMEMS and Single Molecule Dynamics Lab. Some of you might know Professor Jeff Wong. Uh, he has a pretty large lab that spans BME, MECI. Um, and uh, during my time at, in the lab, I did some part-time work at a VC firm uh, uh, just to understand the VC space a little better. Um, and this was around the same time I was applying for consulting jobs just to kind of see if VC is the right place for me. Um, and if you guys have questions about that later on, we can try to uh, answer uh, some of your questions about VC, but I think I'll keep this talk mostly focused on consulting. Um, come from Ohio State before that. So uh, my home office for Guidehouse is, in, is New York City. I was supposed to move into uh, New York City, but as you all know, COVID hit and I am right now working from home um, back in my home in Ohio. So I'm right now in Cincinnati, Ohio. And uh, most of my work that I do is all remote right now um, because of COVID. And I started, as you can see, in August uh, of this year. And um, so it's been like a little more than four months. Um, so also keep that in mind because um, a lot of what I'll be talking about is kind of moving into the consulting world. And um, within those four months, I've done some three going into four, like three and a half or so projects. Um, and so I've had, I've gotten a good amount of experience, but um, I think that as you have different speakers in this in this fire chat fireside chat series uh, you'll get more perspective of people that have been in consulting for a little longer as well so just just keep that in the back of your mind as i talk through some of my experience okay so at a very high level um why should you consider consulting so a lot of you might be phds for me this was especially true came in i was excited wanted to become professor wanted to do something cool in my field um, and uh, the more you stay in your PhD career, the more you realize how difficult that process is and more demoralizing things get as experiments don't work out. Um, but somewhere around like halfway through your PhD, for most people, for me at least, um, I started to think about what are other exit strategies? What are the what are other options that are out there? Um, industry, government, VC, uh, consulting. And all of these are good options and all of these leverage a lot of the um, knowledge and sort of logical reasoning that you develop as uh, during your PhD. Um, but for me, consulting uh, seemed really uh, attractive because it offers a degree of career flexibility. So people can get into consulting and then kind of get back out into any of those other fields, uh, VC, government industry. Um, in very rare cases, I've heard of people going into consulting and then going back into academia. But um, the reason I got, most people will get out of academia is to get out of academia, not to get back in. So um, yeah, I think uh, career flexibility was like the, one of the major reasons why I chose to pursue um, consulting. And uh, really, I think um, there's a lot of consulting firms that recruit heavily at Hopkins, and you're probably aware of that. Um, and uh, these consulting firms are essentially uh, what, what you do as a management consultant is you give expert advice, right? Um, and where your background as a PhD or advanced degree candidate comes in is you have had the opportunity to apply and develop some of that analytical rigor and hypothesis based uh, thought process that goes into a lot of these projects that um, we do as consultants. Um, and you, you all, you probably, um, if you've done a PhD level project or even master level projects have had opportunities to come up with some kind of creative solutions. And a lot of consulting is sort of following it's rigorous analytical um, process, gathering data, making sense out of the data and providing creative implications based on the data. Uh, as a consultant, you get to work on some really interesting problems. So as I said, um, I've done three going on four projects. Um, some have been super fast. The first one that I got put into was like a three week engagement where we had to basically advise a company on whether or not they should acquire another company. Um, m and basically. So that was super fast. Um, so when I talk about living at 2x speed, it was just, um, uh, we'd have like these uh, multiple weekly touch points with the client. Um, and then within between those touch points is um, um, basically gather as much data as you can uh, for the project, kind of leverage all that data to come up with some kind of useful uh, implications and uh, advice for our client. Um, through the consulting uh process uh, or jobs, you also get to work with pretty bright people um, at my company. And we'll talk about this a little later uh, when I show more Guidehouse specific slides. Uh, we have people with 
PhD backgrounds, MD backgrounds, all kinds of different backgrounds. Um, I work with a lot of MBAs, um, obviously, because this is the business world. Um, and you get to really learn a lot from all of these people, as well as on the clients and client side, you get to um, meet some pretty ambitious uh, executives, uh, uh, people that are high up, um, people um, that think about where a company should go in terms of strategy. And um, it's, it's really good to kind of have that sort of rounded experience of um, uh, getting all these perspectives in your mind. Um, and finally, as I said, career flexibility. Um, some cool examples are we, uh, with management consultants moving into other interesting fields, we know that um, our next department or secretary of transportation, Mayor Pete was an ex McKinsey consultant. Um, you'll see a lot of, uh, lot of consultants in a lot of different fields, but uh, uh, there's, there's also like a big chunk of consultants that end up going into sort of VC specific jobs. Um, because uh, there's a lot of transferable skill sets, but you also see a lot of consultants going into industry, into sort of strategy level, management level, um, often executive level um, uh, jobs as well. Okay, so what is life science consulting uh, and where does it sort of fit in? So as you know, there are a lot of different consulting firms out there, a um, lot of sort of broad firms that cover uh, a, a, a wide scope. Um, and a lot of these broad firms also have sort of life science wings that cover uh, life science companies as well. But um, in general, life science consulting is basically consulting for pharmaceutical, biotech, medtech uh, type of companies, and um, often also like regulatory agencies and even government if they're involved in um, uh, any sort of like life science type projects. Uh, this is distinct from healthcare consulting. Healthcare consulting is more about sort of payer provider working with hospitals type consulting. I know that there's a large pipeline of people from Hopkins that go into healthcare specific consulting. Um, I unfortunately don't have that much experience in healthcare consulting, but I know people that are in it. So if you have questions specific to healthcare consulting, again, reach out to me and I can put you in touch with uh, relevant individuals. Um, and in terms of engagements, uh, from my experience, like a lot of life science company, uh, healthcare, life science consulting are around sort of developing strategy. So those, the strategy could be around, as I spoke about before, m and around product development, around competitive landscape assessments or war gaming. Um, you're with a client, the client wants to know what its competitors are gonna do. And um, um, you basically try to set up some scenarios where the client can sort of um, counteract anything that a competitor um, does. Uh, part of it could also be operational in terms of um, optimizing their profit and loss. Uh, also, there's um, quite a bit of people in my firm that do project management specific uh, consulting. So um, if a particular product is being launched by a company, you help them sort of manage the launch process and uh, serve as essentially the um, project managers for that launch process. Uh, that's just an example. Um, other areas could be like regulatory, market access, um, financial optimization. Uh, how, and, and um, in a couple of slides, I'll get into more specific details on what areas of this guidehouse covers, but this is just a very kind of high level picture of life science consulting. Um, and how do you get into these firms? Um, so this is the typical routes for PhDs. And um, uh, there are three different areas here, I would say. Um, one is uh, a lot of you might be aware of the summer workshops. Um, so I can think of at least uh, four or five firms that do uh, pretty solid uh, summer workshops. And these used to be sort of in-person workshops. And I remember doing a couple of them where uh, you basically go in, you meet a lot of different people that are being recruited as well, um, that are sort of still early stage trying to think about whether consulting is the right fit for them, but um, are taking the step to kind of move um, closer to uh, kind of interviewing towards consulting. And uh, you, you get a lot of different sort of uh, uh, team exercises and uh, case exercises. Um, and a lot of these workshops are centered around you solving a case with a team and at the end presenting it to a client and then the client basically asking you questions based on your presentations. Um, and these are great. These are great to get to know um, uh, get to know what consulting is all about, get to meet people, uh, get to network with people. Um, 
and in terms of, I guess, uh, because these happen sort of very, very early in terms of um, the recruitment cycle, uh, the, they often uh, can, uh, you, uh, oftentimes people come into there with very little experience of consulting itself and um, solving cases. Um, and these often lead to first round interviews with uh, particular firms. And because this is such an accelerated process, oftentimes uh, people are just uh, don't have as much time preparing for these interviews. But these are great to get sort of a first impression and leave a first impression and uh, gain your network. Um, and so that, that's one sort of bucket. Uh, not everybody goes through this uh, summer workshop process. They also, there's also sort of more traditional and, um, and something that's absolutely necessary for getting into consulting, which is networking. Um, with JHECC, who I was um, involved with um, during my days at Hopkins, there's a lot of different touch points with uh, actual consultants to build your network and um, start figuring out how they got into consulting and kind of um, help use some of that information um, uh, to kind of chart your path as well. Uh, networking helps with, uh, with uh, referrals, um, uh, and it's, it's absolutely important in the consulting world. Uh, in, in all of these different sort of buckets, you have to be able to connect with people to build your network. And um, only if you are sort of remembered can um, you sort of move on through uh, the breaking uh, into process for consulting. Uh, so yeah, as I said, leverage, leverage JGCC, um, get some experience at consulting itself. I think the pro bono opportunities are great for that. Um, and even the, the case competitions, uh, just to kind of uh, bolster your understanding of what consulting entails. Uh, and I think in, in uh, the vast majority of people that do end up going into consulting go with the traditional application process. And this is like, um, it used to be at least uh, uh, these uh, career fairs at Hopkins where you go and you meet with the representatives and then um, you interview through Handshake. I'm not sure how it's done nowadays um, because of COVID, everything is sort of flipped on its head. Um, but I think the general process still stands. So uh, you apply either through Handshake uh, or online, you speak to people that are in the firm um, and there's typically two rounds of interviews. Um, first round can be uh, on campus or on site. Um, and then there's a second round that is typically on site. And now I'm assuming everything is probably just virtual. Um, and typically with uh, these interviews, they, they happen fast. So um, you'll do your first round interview within a week you'll know about if you're into a second round and after the second round within a week you'll know if you got an offer or not um so in that in that sense i think consult breaking into consulting is great because you get your answer like right away uh, once you're in the interview process um but um sort of getting to that point requires a good amount of uh, uh case practice networking um and just kind of understanding the field better okay um, just want to take a quick detour and I think I'll come back to what the interviews are like and um, what you should expect with the interviews and how you should prepare for the interviews. But before that, I just want to take a quick detour, talk a little bit about GuideHouse. I spoke to our recruitment team and they were like, uh, they, they, they basically, they, they gave me some slides to sort of pitch and I was happy to do so. Um, so GuideHouse, as I mentioned, is a company that acquired Navigant, which is the company that I had entered into. Um, GuideHouse is a large firm. It was a spin out out of, um, out of PwC and uh, was there specifically their public sector uh, consulting firm. So Guidehouse, like Legacy Guidehouse, not um, including Navigant has a lot of uh, projects with uh, government entities, with the regulatory entities, um, uh, uh, not only in the US, but uh, across the world. And um, Navigant jumping into Guidehouse also extends that relationships with uh, commercial entities, so like life science companies, med tech companies, and so on, as well as hospitals, um, which is the healthcare consulting wing. Uh, yeah, so it's a, it's a pretty large consulting firm, a lot of different areas uh, that it stretches out into, um, great community of people, a lot of diverse backgrounds. Um, and so far, I think I, everybody I've met has been like super awesome and nice and uh, very helpful. Uh, to kind of jump in a little deeper, um, with GuideHouse, as I mentioned, there's a lot of different uh, sort of areas that I stretch out into. Where I sit is in commercial health, uh, which is where Navigant was placed. And um, more specifically within commercial health, um, I sit somewhere around the life sciences area. So within commercial health, as I mentioned, we have our payer provider consulting. Um, there is consulting with uh, public health agencies that our life science is getting more and more involved with now. Um, 
uh, so regulatory agencies like uh, FDA and so on. Uh, where I sit is in life sciences with, and we work primarily with pharmaceutical biotech uh, type companies. Let's see. Yep, so our life science area um, in specific is probably has, I think 200, 300 people. Um, we have a large amount of people with advanced degrees. So MD, PhD, PharmD and so on. Um, as well as a good amount of people with uh, MBAs and um, other degrees as well. Uh, we have a, a long uh, standing experience and long standing relationships with a lot of pharmaceutical and med tech companies. A lot of my projects so far have been in sort of this med tech space because that fits in well with my background, which was sort of in device development. And so as I came in, I started to work a lot with these uh, large uh, medical technology firms, all of them sort of top of their uh, area um, in, in terms of uh, market standing. Um, but uh, there's also a good amount of sort of crossover. So uh, I know that in a future project, I'll probably be involved a lot with the pharmaceutical side because um, as you know, that um, med tech and pharma sort of go hand in hand in, uh, um, in marketing a lot of products uh, nowadays. Uh, and so far in my experience, I've also had the opportunity to work with some legacy Guidehouse people as well. So as I mentioned, Guidehouse is more of the public sector organization, but um, with, with the Guidehouse, I've worked so far with some military procurement experts that know a lot about um, procuring uh, for uh, the defense department. I've worked with um, some people in uh, legacy Guidehouse uh, uh, digital team that look at more like sort of software-based consulting. Um, for uh, used to well, used to be public sector companies, but now it's getting more and more entangled, uh, which is great. And uh, it, it sort of offers opportunities um, for people like me in life sciences to also explore areas in the public sector and see um, if, if I like it uh, in that area a little better. Great. Um, so within life sciences, just a quick uh, summary of the types of projects we do. And we covered this a little bit before, but um, they fit into the, sort of these broad buckets, uh, strategy, operations, um, uh, portfolio strategy, go-to-market strategy, things like that, uh, portfolio management. And then a lot of our projects are on the, especially on the pharmaceutical uh, side are related to launch and launch planning and market access and things like that. Okay, so how do you um, apply to Guidehouse? How do you get into Guidehouse? Um, so this, uh, and I think this was, so I don't think you guys have, um, the career fair has probably already happened. So um, now it's more about um, where, uh, you got to think about like where you fit in, into this um, sort of timeline. But um, uh, I'm not sure if Handshake still has uh, the jobs posted for uh, Guidehouse, but we, I do know that we are currently considering intern and senior consultant positions. Um, and for the senior consultant, that's specifically PhDs and MBAs. Uh, so if you are interested, I would say the best way, uh, thing to do is to email me and I can put you in touch with our recruitment team and they'll kind of guide you into like which, where exactly in this timeline do you have to like submit an application and so on. Um, but as I said, um, uh, uh, as it was with the, um, uh, with, when I got into the company, there's an application, there's a first round interview, second round interview, um, and typically a job offer after that. And that process is pretty condensed. Uh, once you get that first interview within like two or three weeks, you should know if you have an offer or not, which is, which is great. Kind of helps you plan your future really well. Okay. So uh, once again, you guys can um, get this uh, email address from the slide or just get it, uh, Iqbal might send it out later on um, and feel free to reach out to me and I can help you put you in touch with the right people. And if um, you have more questions specific for uh, healthcare consulting, just let me know and I can put you in touch with um, people I know in the healthcare consulting wing as well. Okay. Um, so back to the interviews. Uh, so this is coming back to the um, non guidehouse slides and this is just in general for I know, uh, So I have yeah. a question. In your previous okay. slides, you talked about uh, strategy and operations. Those are the areas you are mostly interested in and you are involved. So, yeah. I mean, for a non MBA people like me, I mean, I, I want to know, can you, can you say uh, something about a specific question in the field of strategy or operation? Like, what do you mean by that? Because we mostly spend a lot of time in, on the bench and we don't know what 
what do we mean by strategy here? Right. Yeah. No. That's that's a great question. So, um, I'll share my experience here. Um, and I I had the same sort of uh, uh fear kind of getting in. Like I I I don't really know what any of these mean. Um, how can I kind of contribute to these projects based on my experience? And so on a strategy side, you can think about it um in in one uh, uh in one essence as like what sort of products or um what what sort of um um. Yeah, basically think about it from a marketing sense. So like I have a bunch of products as a company, how should I market these products so that I can get the maximum impact of the product into the market and um, show differentiation over competitors. And so what that would involve then um, in a lot of cases is understanding what the product is from a technical side, which we as PhDs should be able to do that. Um, uh, and then another part of it is just speaking to people that uh, use these products and are involved in sort of the um, um, marketing and selling of these products and, and get their perspectives as well on what they think the strengths of these products might be. And so a lot of it is sort of gathering data, um, gathering data through conversations, gathering data to calls with the client, calls with other key stakeholders. These key stakeholders might be um, physicians in, in, in um, big hospitals. Um, they could be um, sort of uh, primary care physicians. Kind of get a, get a sense of how all of these stakeholders view maybe a certain product or a certain product profile or the market of a certain product. And then sort of put all these learnings together and um, basically suggest to a client that um, we think uh, based on all, everything we have heard that these are the sort of the key areas that you should focus on, um, whether it's in selling this product or whether it's in further developing this product. Um, and maybe these are some areas that you might not have looked into earlier that maybe other products sort of fit in. So, and, and you probably have the capability to add that extra um, uh, add-on into your product to sort of meet that capability and, soup and um, be better than your competitors. Uh, so I, I think at a high level, um, it, it's, it's very hard to uh, kind of, uh, and for every different product, every different company, this will definitely differ. Um, so it's basically going through a very sort of clear delineated process, talking to the right people, getting an understanding of um, what they're trying to accomplish, what the company is trying to accomplish, get perspectives from a lot of different people, tie those perspectives in as sort of data points, and then come up with like a holistic um, pros, cons, unmet needs, gaps. So as an entry level uh, first uh, c consultant, you could be uh, involved in uh, both data collection and also data analysis, right? To de devise a strategy. Yeah, so coming in as a PhD, you are basically, you can be in all of those. Uh, you, and, and what I have noticed is you're also on the client facing side as well. So part of your job will also be to be able to package all of that materials and be able to present it to clients. Um, gotcha. And so uh, there's amount of uh, learning that happens. There are some workshops and I think every company Guidehouse also has sort of workshops to get people up to speed um, with uh, how to present things, how to present things effectively. Um, and so, yeah, you'll be doing data collection, you'll be doing the data analysis, you'll be doing the data presentation, and you can also be like a touch point with the client to sort of facilitate the next steps as well. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's really project dependent, that's really partner dependent, but depending on which partner you're working with in the firm. But I think that um, your experiences so far as a PhD put you, uh, make you well suited to attack all of those because presumably um, during a PhD, you've had enough opportunity to present your data, um, think about how well to present your data, what, what are things that um, you should put in, what are things that will just ask uh, people who ask questions about that you maybe not be able to answer. So maybe kind of take those materials out. Um, so it's, it's a lot of, all of that kind of goes into the types of roles that you'll then be um, well, focused on later on. Yeah, go ahead, please. Yeah, thanks. Good question. Yeah. Okay, so uh, with interviews, there's typically two parts and these apply to both the first round as well as the second round interviews. Um, the first part is a fit. So this is basically behavioral type questions um, where the uh, company as the interviewer is basically trying to get an understanding of your background, trying to get an understanding of um, how well you communicate, uh, your experiences, how well you've demonstrated uh, teamwork or how well you've demonstrated leaderships, uh, how well you solve problems. Um, and so a lot of this is basically coming up with good elevator pitches on yourself, uh, trying to think of good examples of where um, you've been able to uh, sort of fix different problems in different ways um, and uh, sort of answer behavioral questions. And 
that typically is the beginning part of the interview. The second part of the interview and the bulk of it tends to be the case interview part. Um, and I think this is the part that is perhaps the most tricky for people jumping in from academia to consulting because we have like absolutely no experience with uh, business cases and um, how to solve them. Um, the whole case part is basically, it can be interviewer led or interviewee led. So with the interviewer led, you're given, um, during the interview, you're given the verbal question and you have to kind of show your thought processes in answering that verbal question. The interviewee led part is you're given the initial prompt and you're basically running, um, uh, you're basically showing your entire thought process from the beginning to solving uh, whatever that prompt stated as the objective. Uh, and you kind of get feedback from the interviewer as you go on and you can collect, collect more data from the interviewer as you um, sort of go through the process of solving uh, that prompt. Uh, so a lot of this is just basically how well you organize uh, a problem and how well you split the problem into bite-sized questions. Uh, and a common types of uh, cases that are used in interviews are sort of uh, revenue growth, profitability. Profitability is probably like the thing that people sort of jump into when they learn cases and um, uh, kind of understand frameworks on how to solve profitability cases. Um, but it calls, could also be business situations and M&A. Um, and later uh, in this uh, presentation, we'll talk a little bit about a, a growth specific case and um, kind of talk about some strategies that might be there to um, solve a revenue growth specific case. So I think um, because uh, there is, because such a small amount of PhDs or advanced degree candidates go into consulting, um, I think uh, there, there should be more knowledge out there on how much one should practice for these cases because not everybody is going to come in with um, with uh, with basically a full understanding of what the uh, question that's being asked entails, and be able to kind of just rattle off and solve the case. It it takes a lot of practice. Um, I would say that ninety percent of people that are going from PhD into consulting need like at least fifty cases uh, uh, practiced before they actually enter um, the first interview. Um, and towards this end, there's a lot of resources. I know uh, JHCC offers a lot of resources. There are some books out there. Uh, and these are, these are some of the books that uh, I've found useful or people told me have been useful. Uh, a lot of people have case books out there that have a list of cases. And if you ask around your peers, um, I'm sure they'll be able to help you in identifying some of those uh, case books. But um, I cannot understate how important practice is. Uh, so find partners or find one partner or multiple partners that you can just go back to, schedule Zoom meetings with. Um, for an hour or two and just go back and forth with the case. And um, I think uh, a lot of the confidence that comes later on in solving cases is developed during these practices. Okay. Um, so what is, how do you go kind of go about it and how is the case typically uh, structured? Um, so typically, and this applies to interviewee-led or interviewer-led, and I'm kind of generalizing for both over here, um, in the beginning part of the case, uh, you're establishing the background. So the interviewer will uh, introduce the case, kind of give you the prompt, um, and it's your job to kind of understand the uh, underlying objectives behind the prompt and kind of ask clarifying questions to get a full understanding of what, uh, what you're going to be doing for the next uh, 30 odd minutes. The next part, and I think this is a very important part, is structuring your approach. Um, so typically you will... Uh, the, you'll get the prompt, you clarify what the prompt is, and then you spend some time, um, you ask for some time basically to structure your approach. And then you spend three to four minutes, sometimes even five minutes if you need um, to kind of come up with buckets. And we, we uh, have this concept of MISI, which is um, mutually exclusive, uh, collectively exhaustive. Uh, what that basically means is you want to structure your approach in buckets, two or three or four buckets, where uh, each bucket is covering up, solving a part of the prompt that the other buckets don't solve. And we, the, some of the examples later on we'll show kind of make that a little clearer. So you want to have mutually exclusive and then collectively exhaustive buckets that can kind of go together in um, breaking down the prompt and coming up with a clear solution or recommendation based on the prompt. 
Uh, the next part is once you have developed your approach, you present your approach uh, to the interviewer and if they're okay with it, uh, they might pressure test portions of that approach and um, they'll move on to kind of give you some data. Uh, and so these data can be presented in graphs, it can be presented um, verbally and it's your job to then kind of figure out how to analyze the data. Is it, uh, do they, should we come up with a quantitative way to analyze the data? Should we come up with sort of a qualitative, qualitative way to assess the data? Um, once you have done all of that quantitative and qualitative part, you put it all together and then you develop a recommendation for, um, uh, for your interviewer and then you present it as you would present to like a CEO or some uh, high level executive uh, at a firm. Um, and typically you'll take some time to kind of write down the key points that you want to put in your recommendation. And then once you're ready, you present it in the most concise manner and clear manner as possible. So let's jump into a case. And I think the best way to do this will be um, that for some of uh, the questions, I might ask you to send uh, some of your thoughts via chat. And then for some other ones, it would be great if you guys can just unmute and jump in and um, offer your thoughts on how you would respond to those questions. Okay. All right. Um, and so general tips as we get into this, um, you want to be as relaxed as possible. Uh, listen to the question as carefully as possible. In, in this particular case, you'll have the actual words written out, so you'll be able to see uh, what the question is. So that's good. Um, but know that in an actual case, this question is being dictated to you. You're not actually looking at it. So um, you have to just basically pick up as much of key information as possible, make notes of it, write it down so that you can um, sort of synthesize that and kind of re-deliver it in a concise manner. Yeah, so um, be concise, state your assumptions, and uh, we'll give some examples on how to state your assumptions a little later. Um, make sure that if you're gonna make a conclusion, try to make it based on data. So don't just have a random guess, um, data-driven guess is much better. Uh, and uh, whenever you can, try to be quantitative. If you're comparing two numbers, um, try to put in some quantitative comparisons like this number is this percent bigger than that other number, or um, this percent is three, uh, this other one number is three times bigger than some other number. Okay, so here's our prompt. So I'll read it to you guys, and then um, we'll move on to the next step. So our client is a small drug manufacturer called Devco, and it's based in the United States. And Devco is currently has one drug on the market sold mainly in the US, but has also sold to a lesser degree in UK and Germany. Uh, Devco is looking to increase its presence in Europe and is considering expanding into Poland, Spain, and France specifically. Uh, Devco is interested in knowing which country it should expand into and what criteria should be used for choosing a country. Okay, so that's your question. Uh, the first thing I think we should do is um, Try to see if you understand what the question is asking. And if you don't, try to ask some clarifying questions. So if you guys can, in the chat, feel free to throw in some questions you would want to ask for clarification around this question. Um, I, I strongly suggest you unmute yourself and you can ask a question directly. I mean, that will save us some time of typing, right? Absolutely. Yeah, and I, Hi, and Anu. Um, first of all, thank you for being here. Um, I think one of the things that I was thinking was uh, competition for the drug, what other products exist in those um, other spaces uh, that they're interested in expanding to. Absolutely, I think that's a, that's a good question to ask. Um, I think another strategy for clarifying questions is to, un to get a good understanding of what exactly they're trying to accomplish. So kind of get a quantitative understanding if you can of what the objective of this prompt is. Um, so are they saying that they want to increase something by a certain number by a certain time? Um, if you can kind of coax them into giving you any kind of quantitative insight um, that I want to um, increase the sales of uh, this particular product by this particular percent by this particular time, then I think that would be interesting. But when you phrase your question, you obviously don't want to say, um, uh, what percent do you want to increase your sales? You want to kind of phrase it in a more general term of uh, um, 
what is uh, what is the client's end objective, um, and by when do you want to meet that objective? Something like that. Thank um, you. Are there any? Yeah. Yeah. Just a quick question about this. A uh, couple of questions. So the small drug manufacturer. It, by that we mean the manufacturer is a small company, not a small molecule drug manufacturer. Just to be con con just confirming on that. Yes. And secondly, uh, when we are looking at expanding into a country, we are just looking into sales, not opening a fact. Okay, great. Thanks. Yeah. So those are those are two very good clarifying questions. Um, the first one is that it is a small drug manufacturer, so it's not the, it's not small molecule. Um, the second one I think is a very important one, which is um, what it's getting to like, what is the, what is sort of the thing that the company is looking to achieve? Um, and by expansion, uh, they want to sell more drugs. And so therefore they want to increase their sales. And so I think getting that information early on and then the uh, interviewer can tell you something like, oh yeah, we want to increase uh, our sales and get the maximum increase by a certain number of certain time frame. Um, uh, that can kind of uh, uh, spawn that kind of answer from uh, the interviewer. So yeah, that's a that's a good question to ask. Anything question. Else? Um, um, uh, are we also assuming that the drug already has regulatory approval in those three countries? Um, yeah, I it's think, not being sold off label. In yep, UK, I, Germany. That that's a good question, and I think um, that also can have an effect later on on the market share. For example, that dr the drug will be able to capture. So and if whether a particular timeline can be met. So I think um, so that's another good question to ask. Yeah. Oh, I would like to also ask about the exact drug, what disease will treat and the prevalence of that uh, condition in these different countries. Yep, and I think that is one of the most important questions there. And uh, if you want to sell this drug in another, com uh, in another country, there has to be a market to sell this drug. And if um, people don't have that particular disease, um, if the incidence is low, if the if there's like people, if the growth rate is low, then um, why go into that country and sell that drug? So absolutely, market, very important. Um, it sounds to me like they are uh, trying to quantitatively um, approach basically a um, like some type of like regression analysis or, or something, you know, where you can um, identify which variable um, how it affects um, the dependent variable. And I'm just curious what those variables might be, those independent variables that uh, um, we might be factoring in uh, quantitatively once we have data to, to, to look at that. Yeah, and I think, I think that's a bit open-ended. So it might be better to kind of give some examples of the types of variables you would want to look for. So whether that's um, growth rate or uptake or I guess treatment rate or something like that, I think that would be better for the interviewer to get an understanding of what is the type of information that you're um, kind of asking or looking for. Um, so okay. yeah, yeah, I think I think that question is, it has good intentions, but I think was a little more open-ended open than what we would like. Got it. Okay, so I'll go ahead and jump to um, sort of three clarifying questions that I think stand out and can give the most piece of, um, important pieces of information. Um, and one is, what is the drug, as in um, what does it treat? Um, why those three countries in Europe? And is there a particular timeline? And these informations can kind of go into better understanding what the major objective is in um, this particular prompt. And the oh, answer- just a quick question. I'm mm -hmm. sorry. Um, I'm wondering if, would it be beneficial if we ask what caused these drugs to be sold in, to a lesser degree in UK and uh, Germany? and kind of analyze these factors. I, I think that's a good, because that was mentioned in the in the prompt. So it is it is something worth asking because it might be a hint towards uh, um, that sales might be low in uh, Germany and, and, and UK for some reason. Um, and that's why, but I think I think at the end of the day, they want to, the, the question is going towards which country should I pick from these three countries, right? So if you kind of bog down the analysis towards um, uh, these other countries that might have slow uh, sales, then you might not, it might basically elongate the timeline to get to the answer of which one of those three countries you should choose. So you want to be strategic and um, you can ask that questions, you might get an answer, but maybe it's not worth dwelling too much time on that answer because then it'll kind of take too long to come to a final um, answer. I, I have another question about that in, in that these 
questions here are really broad, and I think a lot of the questions that we asked were encompassed in these. Mm -hmm. Are they looking for you when they set up the case? Are they looking for you to ask broad questions that encompass a lot of different topics? Um, so it takes up less time to ask those few questions than it would for us to ask numerous questions that get at these three major categories. Yeah, I think, so if I give you the answers, I think you it'll be probably more clear. So the questions are phrased pretty broadly. And I think um, it really depends on the interviewer if they want to just um, probe you more on like what exactly are you asking or if they'll just straight up give you um, uh, the answer that uh, you should be looking for basically. Um, so I think that you have to have an understanding of um, your interviewer. And I think uh, that first 15 minutes is important into understanding if this is, is this somebody that is going to kind of keep pushing me towards um, a very particular answer or asking my questions in a very particular way, or is this someone that I can ask a question relatively broadly and that can kind of give me more. So I think what helps in that regard is starting your question broad and then kind of just offering some examples of, um, um, so like uh, what is the uh, drug our client manufacturers, for example, like what, what indication does it treat? Are there multiple indications and so on? And so that way you, covered some example details of the types of answers that they might give. And um, that also tells them that you're thinking about it in a broad umbrella as well. I know another quick question. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, uh, this is kind of a broader question in general, in cases like these. Is it, uh, it is, is it important here to bring in, is it important to have an understanding of how EU say approval process works? So for example, in EU, like, should we treat it, the question at the face value of it? Or should you bring your own domain specific knowledge into it? Like for example, approval might not be a question here because if Germany has approved it, that means the entire EU has kind of approved it in terms of regulatory process. Is this information valuable or should I, I just treat it at the face value? I would, I would uh, not bring that up in the clarifying questions part. I would bring that up later in the analysis part. So oftentimes mm -hmm. you can mention something like risks of um, pursuing this route and then that's where um, you can mention something like um, the if you do have any idea of like the regulation regulatory process in Germany is like longer than the regulatory process in some other country, then that's something you can bring up as mm -hmm. like a potential risk in, in going into that particular place. Um, I think those those no, uh, area specific insights are useful in showing that you're kind of leveraging your existing understanding as well as your new understanding and kind of putting it all together and synthesizing the information. Um, you want to kind of show that off somewhere, but I don't think the clarifying question is the best place to show that off. It's too early um, in the case to kind of show you. Here, you just want to figure out what are, what are they asking and what type of information should I be looking for in coming up with an answer. And Thank you. Uh, yeah, and I, I think there was like an example uh, uh, in one of my interviews, I remember there it was a, it was a case about um, a, it, it was a government that, uh, had uh, basically asked the consulting firm to see how they can uh, implement a uh, Wi-Fi hotspots, more Wi-Fi hotspots, and how will that help them in um, kind of bettering some of the things that uh, some of the infrastructure uh, uh, that are in the country. And so I think one of the things in the country, I think was like some Southeast, it was like Thailand or something. Um, and uh, one of my answers, I think, had to do with like uh, optimizing transportation routes. So if you have, wi if you have, uh, if you know where Wi-Fi is, if you with the through the Wi-Fi hotspots, if you know the location of the people kind of going around the country, um, then you can uh, optimize transportation. And then something that I just threw in there that I don't even know if this is legit, uh, legitimate or not, but I know that they have like the tuk-tuks, the little like three wheelers in uh, Thailand. And I was like, yeah, like those those um, are run by the government and this can offer um, sort of better routes or sort of better placements of these around the country. So uh, you're catering to your population a little better. But yeah, adding those like kind of random pieces of knowledge you have shows your breadth of expertise, but I think I'm saving it later on in your, uh, in, in your conclusions or risks well, will be a little better. Okay, that's the random tangent. Let's come back to this. So, okay. So I think important pieces of information here is we know that our drug is an anti-clotting drug used during angioplasties, which is type of heart surgery. Um, we're considering those three countries uh, because they have the three largest populations essentially uh, behind UK and Germany. Uh, and so that's 
an important piece of information because that kind of goes towards one of the questions, which was, should we be considering the market um, in finding the right country? And so this basically says that we're going after the largest population and hence we're probably going after the, where the largest market exists. Uh, and then the timeline is important as well. Um, and they want to, they, they're looking at a five-year time frame. Basically. I didn't have practice the purpose of pinating these cookies and it's not good for the stomach. It's just don't be that much sugar. Oh. Sorry, you're gonna eat. Think, okay. Yeah, I'm sorry about that. Oh, no problem. Someone forgot to unmute. <laughs> cookie sounds good to me too. Yeah. Um, but, <laughs> uh, so yeah, we're looking at a five-year window. So whatever quantitative analysis that we end up doing, we'll have to project it to a five-year window. And so let's move on. And I think I am running low on time now. So we'll um, try to move a little quickly, but uh, important parts here, uh, you want to synthesize the key points. Uh, you want to clarify unfamiliar terminology, clarify objective, clarify scope. Um, and then you go into structuring your analysis. So uh, let's see what kind of... Yeah, so as you structure, so what you then want to do is once you get this clarifying information, uh, you basically understood your question. Then you say, look, can you give me like, like a couple of minutes? I just want to focus on this and come up with those three mutually exclusive, collectively exhaustive buckets. Doesn't have to be three, um, could be between two to four. If you, if you can make more, great. Um, and this is where you can really show your creativity and your problem solving uh, ability and your kind of logical reasoning ability. As you make these buckets, you want to think about how you want to prioritize the buckets. So um, for example, here, we, one thing we definitely want to look for is um, the market. And so I think the, if you have like um, market as your first bucket, maybe something else as your second bucket, and then um, another thing as your third bucket, I think that would be helpful. And I, I'll let you guys give some ideas of yours for like what those, um, what three or two or three buckets should be. Um, but before we get to that, uh, another thing that I want to stress is it's good to be creative here. So as you practice cases and a lot of case books have these um, stock generic uh, buckets for different types of cases. So for profitability, they'll say, um, uh, look at uh, sort of uh, uh, like a revenue price and some other one um, and, uh, and cost. And uh, th there's like different, uh, different stock buckets that people have made. Um, it's great to know them. It's great to have them in the back of your mind uh, as you start your practice. But I think as you get more and more involved in your practice, it's good to kind of tinker them as needed for each particular case. So um, rather than just saying revenue bucket, you want to say something like um, more specific to your uh, sales of uh, some sales of this particular product in this particular market uh, is something I want to look at or something like that. Or, or you can be more creative and kind of spin it in a different way. It doesn't have to be just revenue. Um, but creativity always helps in setting up these buckets. Okay, so uh, when, you make up, when you make your bucket, the question you wanna answer is what key areas would you want to explore in order to understand which country DevCo should enter? So you guys can um, unmute yourself and just kind of shout out, just even if it's just one area or two areas or anything that comes to mind, um, what are sort of the key areas you'd want to look at in structuring these buckets? Sales forecast. Okay, great. Anything else? Population with heart, I mean, I'm assuming it's because for angioclotting. So I'm assuming population who suffers from heart diseases or is at risk, or what's Great. the percentage of population that will determine the market. Okay. And so let's take these two examples that we were given, sales forecast and population that uh, has angioplasties. Um, if you were to prioritize these two, which one would you prioritize um, and why? sales forecast because it includes um, the, the demand. Okay, but I'm in more in terms of priority, in terms of what you want to talk to or what kind of data you want to get first, um, which data would you think you would be think, given first? I think market population is easier to estimate than a sales forecast because sales forecast can be found out from the market population. If we assume a certain percentage of people who will take our drug and who will move into our ecosystem in general. So I exactly. think that one, but open to more ideas to see how it goes. Yeah, I think, I think that's a fair answer because um, as you sort of start to come up uh, uh, or as you start to request data for kind of solving this case, before you can get anything uh, in terms of sales forecast, you'll get 
uh, you want to get an idea of uh, what sort of market will you reach. And only then can you account for sort of price and then understand how sales will be. Um, so kind of thinking about like when you structure these buckets, what you want to talk about first, what you want to talk about second, what you want to talk about third is important. And seeing like which one will help you figure out the other one is important as well. Okay. Um, so this is uh, just an example. Your buckets don't actually have to be exactly these, but um, we would want to look for angioplastic, angioplasty market in three countries, look at size, growth rate, recent trends. Um, then to understand market share, we'd want to look at competition. So we obviously will not take over the entire market in these three countries. We'll only take a percentage of that market. Um, so who are the other competitors and um, how well are they already uh, placed in those countries? How, how um, well are they penetrated into the market and how well can we penetrate into the market? And so part of that is understanding how does our product differ. Uh, and then the final one bucket is uh, this sort of tertiary implementation risks. Uh, so yeah, great, we can get into this market, but um, as someone had mentioned earlier, there's regulatory structures and building relationships and all these that can carry some inherent risks. And it's important to kind of delineate, delineate some of these risks because you're saying that you don't have like a single answer for your question because there are a lot of uh, headwinds. So you have some tailwinds, but then you also have some headwinds that can kind of slow your approach or uh, be uh, important barriers to your approach. So just and a quick I, question. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, logistics and manufacturing comes under distribution issues, right? Uh, sure, yeah. So I think uh, here we're, it could be, yeah. So when you say distribution issues, you say, yeah. for example, logistics and manufacturing. Um, but that's not something that's typically asked or asked in particular for this case. So that's something that could be an another thing where you say that I understand distribution a little better. And I can say that these are two components that go into distribution and these could be a risk, yep. Okay. And that's something that's very relevant now with uh, with the COVID vaccine. So I think that's that's worth bringing up, yep. Okay, um, data. So we'll, we'll look through this real fast. Um, as you're presented data, it's important to come up with sort of a takeaway for each graph that's presented. And it's good to kind of have some quantitative insights into that takeaway. So can someone just give like a quick summary, like a, uh, like a 10 second summary of what they take away from this particular graph? Or it doesn't have to be 10 seconds. Just say like, what, what, what is this graph showing you? What does the graph tell you at all? There's uh, more than a two and a half times uh, cumulative incidence of angioplasty in France as compared to Poland uh, and, and almost double the number in Spain. Absolutely, yeah. So having those uh, relative comparisons is very important. Um, so yeah, two and a half times, very good use of the comparisons. Um, and you're basically saying that France has the biggest potential market, um, most angioplasties, and it's like three times, two and a half times bigger than um, one of the other countries we're considering and um, some bigger than uh, Spain as well. Okay, so that's the first piece of information. And uh, another thing you want to do is just kind of jot down the important details here. Um, so here we have, and we, we won't go into the quantitative analysis, but here we have just take, um, we'd write down that 20,000 angioplasties happen in Poland, 45,000 or so happen in Spain, and then like 75,000 or so happen in France. Um, next piece of information we get is growth rate. So we know that um, uh, it's, it, uh, uh, the rate of angioplasties per year is growing um, by 10% in Poland. Um, it's relatively flat in Spain. It's actually falling by 5% in France. And we can then take all that information together and kind of get an initial understanding of the market. And they remember they asked us for a five-year projection. Um, so they can ask us a question of based on the data, and without going into sales forecast, without going into the other buckets we talked about, just based on the data you have, what are your current thoughts about which market um, they should enter? And so we can just take these quantitative insights that we've give, been given via the graph, whoops, and um, come up with come up with some sort of um, market forecast here. So over five years, we know in these different countries, based on a particular growth rate, um, we'll have a certain amount of people that would be in our total market, um, not considering how much percent of the market we can capture. 
uh, and I think uh, it's also important when you do these quantitative analysis is to list your assumptions. And so before you do actually do that, uh, uh, those calculations, you would say that my assumption is things like the price will be the same. Um, we will acquire 100% of the market. And then I would not assume uh, compounding uh, growth. It would just be the same amount of growth uh, taken from the first year applied to every other year subsequent. So once you set that up and you, you tell your interviewer, like, this is the analysis I want to do. This, these are the calculations I want to do. And I will set it up in this sort of table. And if, they're on, if they don't like it, if they think you missed out something, they'll be like, oh, what about this other part? Um, if they like it, they'll let you do it. And then you can kind of go ahead and finish out your calculations. Um, Sorry, can you, can you explain why you wouldn't include compounding growth? You can, you can, but um, if you're if you make the assumptions that you don't do it and you ask, kind of um, get permission from your interviewer that you don't need to do it, then it saves you a lot of time. Um, yeah, thank you. Yeah, so basically you want to get the top line insight without spending like um, hours or I guess many minutes getting the percentage of like 59.5 or whatever. So um, if, if, they, if they let you do it, you do it. Um, if they say, no, you can't make that assumption, then you uh, compound. Okay, um, and then once you come up with the answer, um, it's important to kind of give what the insight is that these numbers provide. Um, so something would be some, an uh, insight example would be here uh, is that based on the data and the assumptions, I would recommend the client enter the French market because although the French market is shrinking, it'll still represent the largest market for a client, client struggle for the next five years. Um, so this is a very condensed sort of case. Um, realistically, something like this would go on to the next step and say, uh, maybe you'll tie it to a price, maybe you'll tie it to there's so much competition and only so much percent of the market can be captured. So then you'll have to kind of break those uh, numbers down even further. Um, but this kind of gives you an idea of what the flow of uh, the case could be. Um, are there any questions here? I, I think uh, over time, so I just want to go to the final slide. If no yeah. Questions. Please go ahead. I think we can have questions at the end. Okay, great. Okay, so just final thoughts, um, things that I think I've kind of learned uh, in my four months and hopefully will solidify as I work more is uh, a lot of consulting is, they say having strong opinions loosely held. So we come from an environment where, for at least for PhDs, we're sort of the subject matter experts. Um, we know what we have based on our data and no one else has that data. So we are pretty sure about um, our conclusions and um, people that challenge us typically have not done the same experiment. So they don't know what they're talking about. In this particular case, um, you're going up against people and clients that have had way more experience than you in um, gaining insights. And so having strong opinions, data uh, verified opinions is very important and being able to convey that with confidence is very important, but you also have to assess what kind of pushback you get on those and um, have the ability to kind of um, uh, be agile and sort of uh, uh, structure your opinions based on input that you get from your clients as well and not be like too hell bent on just one way and one approach. Um, opportunities to learn continuously. So I have been exposed to very many therapeutic areas, uh, orthopedic, cardiovascular, um, trauma, and just, uh, just list goes on. And I think I, I've learned a lot than I ever did um, in, in my PhD in terms of um, these different new therapeutic areas. My PhD was very deeply focused into like one type of diagnostics for one type of infectious disease. And now I'm kind of getting a way, way broader um, set of learning. And I think that helps. I think that kind of um, was what I was looking for in a uh, consulting career is to get an understanding, a broader understanding and be able to apply some of um, my learnings from PhD into like these new areas. And I think I'm, I'm getting an opportunity to do that. Uh, you get to interface with executives, uh, be exposed to decision-making up close. Um, that's like almost true for uh, most management consulting uh, jobs. Career flexibility we talked about before. Um, there are some cool blogs and other uh, resources online if you want to look at how people are discussing different consulting projects. Um, but I think the most important of these resources will be your peers, at least if you are looking to start preparing for interviews, leverage your peers, leverage JHCC, start practicing like right away and a lot. So practice, practice, practice. I think that should be like the key takeaway here is practice cases. 
Great. Um, yeah, otherwise, thanks for your guys' time. I'm happy to take any questions for like a couple of minutes, but I do have to kind of bounce in a little bit. Yeah, thanks a lot, uh, Anu. That was really helpful. And I think uh, so far, one of the best sessions uh, that I've hosted. Uh, you can, you guys can uh, ask your questions in the chat box or I'll uh, conclude with some uh, uh, announcements. No questions? Okay. Uh, a lot of appreciation for you, Anu. Thank you. Uh, you can Thank see you it in the chat box. Uh, well, yeah. Uh, so, I mean, this is going to be the last one for this year and I hope uh, I wish you all a very happy holidays. And the next time we will meet will be on January 29th. And we have uh, another fantastic lineup of speakers from both industry and academia, people from uh, BCG, LEK, Life Sciences, Consulting, Bain, Simon Kutcher. And some of the speakers will also bring in um, recruiters from their company. So it would be a good idea to uh, network with them. Uh, and also learn about different. So every time we have someone from a new company, we will have a different topic like strategy and uh, uh, you know career pivots and all these things. Uh, the next one will be on January 29th, where we'll have, um, I'll, I'll send out the links, but just to give you a heads up, it's going to be Manu Lakshmanan. He's a former McKinsey uh, consultant and he has written a book on case interviews. So that I guess will be helpful and as Anu has suggested, practice, practice, practice. So with that, I'd like to uh, close this session and thanks a lot for your uh, time. Thanks, Anu. All right, thanks guys. Thank you.